presents Nick Carter, famous for chasing crime. Every week at this time, two great names are joined. Sir brings you one of the most resourceful and daring characters in all detective fiction. Nick Carter, Master Detective. All set, Patsy, for a little accident? I, I guess so, Nick. I feel like a Hollywood stunt woman about to be pushed off a cliff. Just do as I told you. There shouldn't be any danger. The Underwriters Association is going to feel awfully bad about having this nice new car wrecked. Not if it gets results, they won't. All right, hold tight. Here's the curve. And here we go. Now, the case of the lucrative wrecks. Today's exciting Nick Carter adventure. Our story begins with a young couple, Bob and Peggy Anderson, trying out their brand new car. Ah, uh, listen to that motor purr, Peggy. Oh, it feels good to be at the wheel of a new car again. Bob, this hill is steep. Maybe there's a curve at the bottom. <laughs> if there were a curve, it would be marked. You don't see any marker, do you? No, but... Bob, there is a curve. What? Gosh, <laughs> hold tight, Peggy. The fence! We're going through the fence! <laughs> Peggy. Peggy, you all right? I... I guess so. Oh, how about you? Oh, I, uh, I got a bump in my head, I guess, but no bones broken. Oh. Here, let, let me help you out. Yeah. Oh, Bob, our new car, it's a total wreck. Yeah. Golly, we not only went through the fence, we went halfway through the wall of this barn. Say, you too. Don't try to get away. Well, who's trying to get away? Put down that shotgun, you idiot. Young fella, you mighty near ruined my barn with your reckless driving. Done near a thousand dollars damage to it. A thousand dollars? The whole barn isn't worth that. Don't go getting sassy, young lady. I'm a deputy sheriff, I am. Oh, now, look, mister, we... Uh, could... name is Dillon. All right, Mr. Dillon. You'll get paid for the damage as soon as I can arrange it. I want cash, young fella. Oh, I... I haven't got enough with me. I get the cash, or I hold your car. Look, we can work this out somehow. Yeah? Uh-huh. Well, look, uh, tell you what. I got a nephew in the garage business... Now, this wreck of yours might be worth two or three hundred to him. Now, here's my proposition. I'll take what's left of the car and call it quits. But oh, that's wait not a minute. Fair. Take it or leave it. Well? Oh, all right. I know when I'm licked. <laughs> yeah, Mace. Another wreck this afternoon. Mighty nice new royal coupe. Here's a bill of sale. Yeah, good work, Dylan. <laughs> Arranged another wreck by taking down that sign that says one and curve ahead, did you? <laughs> <laughs> I sure did, Rocky. <laughs> okay, Dylan. They got that bill of sale to Elmer Eustace. Uh, same as usual, huh? All right. And, uh, Rocky. Yeah? Look in the files and see if we got a wine-colored royal coupe model 76. Okay, Ace. Got a customer for a new job. Just itching to pay a big price. Well, there's no Model 76 Royal Coke listed in the boss's files. Oh. All right, Rocky, come on. Let's go out and see if we can pick one up. Well, uh, there are the records, Mr. Carter. In the past three months, has been a positive epidemic of thefts of new cars. But Mr. Benson, hasn't a single car been recovered? Not one. That's why the Underwriters Association is asking you to take the case. Very well. But I warn you, I'll have to have a free hand, no matter how strange my methods may seem. Of course. Now, uh, what can we do for you first? I'd like a list of all the cars stolen in the last three months, together with the names of their owners. Certainly. Oh, uh, Miss Collins. Yes, Mr. Benson. Have you the car theft file? Oh, yes, Mr. Benson. I thought you'd want it. Here it is. Oh, thank you. Uh, that's all right now, Miss Collins. Yes, Mr. Benson. Here you are, Mr. Carter. Anytime you want me, day or night, please call me. If I'm not in, call Miss Collins. Oh, uh, here. Here's her home phone number. And uh, here's mine. Thanks. Now, if you'll excuse me, I've got some work to do. Oh, Nick. Hmm? Oh, 
Yes, Patsy. If you can bear to give up playing with those radio sets for a minute, Mr. Benson from the underwriters is here. Oh, good. I was just going to call him. All right. Show him in, Patsy. Right, Nick. Mr. Benson, will you step in here? I'll say I will. Mr. Carter, do you realize that it's 48 hours since we gave you a free hand on this case? And in that time, you haven't lifted a finger. Oh, yes, I have, Mr. Benson. In my own way, of course. Do you know that another one of our clients had his car stolen last night? Yes, I know, and I'm sorry. But I couldn't do anything last night. Now I can. Well, uh, that's something at least. I'll need three cars from you. What? Three new cars. Three new cars? What for? That I can't tell you. But give me the three cars, and I think I can promise you action in a hurry. Hmm. Well, all right, all right. I guess it can be arranged. I'll have them here this afternoon. But frankly, Mr. Carter, we want results. Well, Nick, I just left the last of those three cars at 7th and Washington Streets. Now, maybe you'll break down and tell me what this is all about. Why, Patsy, I thought you'd figure the whole thing out by now. Oh, all I know is that you had me park those three beautiful new cars in different parts of the city, and they're supposed to be bait for this car-stealing gang. Well, why didn't you have me put them someplace where you can watch them? Oh, but I am watching them, Patsy. Oh, are you kidding? I am not. Huh? Under the back seat of each of those cars, I've hidden one of those little radios you said I was playing with. What? They're really small, compact sending sets with an individual signal and a two-mile range. Catch on? Oh, I think I do, Nick. If anybody steals one of those cars... The radio starts sending out a signal automatically. <laughs> and with a direction finder in my car, we can follow the stolen car straight to the gang's hideout. Now, if that gang will just pick up one of those cars... Nick, they have. How do you like that for service? Wait. That's the signal from the Royal Coop you parked at the corner of Sixth and Johnson. We've got to get there fast. <laughs> must be straight ahead of us, Nick. The signal's been getting louder ever since we turned that last corner. Yeah. Thieves are taking it out this road. Must be headed for some place in the suburbs. But there's nothing in sight, except that big truck up ahead. Why don't you pass it? Because that wouldn't do any good. Huh? What do you mean? I mean, the stolen car's on that truck, what? under that big canvas. Why, I never thought of that. Neither did I. Not until I saw that the truck was the only thing in sight. Pretty clever way of transporting a stolen car, isn't it? Oh, I'll say it is. Uh-oh, a freight train coming. Yeah, I'd better stop back here. I don't want to get too close to the truck. They might see... Nick, the truck's not stopping. Great Scott. They're going to try to get across the tracks in front of the train. Oh, Nick. Confound it, they made it. But we can't. And look at the length of this train. It must be a mile long. Worse than that, it's stopping. Well... <sighs> How do you like that? I don't. Before this darn thing gets out of our way, that truck will be so far away, we won't be able to pick up the radio signal. Certainly looks as though luck's against us. Well, so Nick lost the first round in his battle to break up the ring of car thieves. But he's lost more than that. He's lost a brand new car lent to him to use as bait. We'll see what that leads to in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the lucrative Rex. Today's Nick Carter adventure it is the following afternoon, and Nick and Patsy in Nick's car are cruising around town, hoping to pick up a signal from one of the other cars they planted as bait. Hadn't been for that doggone freight train, I might have the gang rounded up by now. Nick, listen. Huh? That's the signal from the radio in the Royal Coop that they got away with. Yeah. It's getting louder. Now it's getting faint again. And did you notice that it got louder just as that wine-colored royal coupe ahead passed us? Hey, that's the car that was stolen from us. Oh, it's not getting away from us again. I'm going to force it to the curb. Hey, pull over. What's the big idea? Pull over and stop. Why, you stupid? Watch out! Hey, what's going on here? You tried to wreck me. No, I didn't. I just want to stop you. Stolen car you're driving. Stolen car? You're crazy. I just bought it an hour ago. Paid spot cash for it. Maybe, but it's still a stolen car. Now, see here. I'm Judge Pearson, and if you think Judge you... Pearson, my name is Carter. Nick Carter. Oh. Oh, sure. I've heard of you, Mr. Carter. But I still say I bought this car legally. Hmm, look, here's the bill of sale. Mm-hmm. 
Told you by a man named Elmer Eustace. Address 3192 Grand Avenue. Bill sales in order, all right. The engine number it gives is wrong. But it can't be wrong. Look at the number on the engine and see for yourself. Thanks, Judge. I will. This is the car, all right. I recognize that tiny scratch on the door. So do I. The engine number will clinch it. Let me get the hood up. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, let's see. D4-777-89. Well, that's the number on the bill of sale. But that's not the motor number of the coupe that was stolen from us. No, it's not. It's obviously the real motor number. Hasn't been tampered with in any way. Well, are you satisfied? Yes, I... Yes, I've made a mistake, Judge. I told you so. Next time, better make sure of your facts. Nick, you let him go. You didn't even look to see whether the radio was under the back seat. Didn't have to, Patsy. That's the car that was stolen, all right, even if the engine number is different. Well... Patsy, listen. Go down to the Motor Vehicle Bureau and find out who originally registered a Royal Coupe with motor number D477789. Right. Where are you going? I'm going to drop in on Mr. Elmer Eustace, the man who sold that car to Judge Pearson. I'd like to speak to Mr. Eustace. Is he in? Uh, yes, he's in, young man. But I don't know if he'll speak to you. I think he will. May I come in, please? Oh, uh, no, young man. Elmer doesn't live here. He lives next door. Next door? Yes. Right there on the other side of the fence. But that's a cemetery. Yes. Elmer's been dead 20 years. <laughs> Elmer Eustace has been dead for 20 years. Yes, Patsy, very dead. Huh. And what did you find out at the Motor Vehicle Bureau? Oh, well, the car you asked about was registered several days ago by a man named Robert Anderson. He lives only a few blocks from here, so on the way back, I stopped in to see him. What did he say? Well, his story, Nick, is that he bought a wine-colored royal coupe and wrecked it the same day. Huh. He gave the wreck to a man named Frank Dillon to pay for damage the car did to Dillon's bomb when it ran off the road. A, a car, I mean, not the bomb. Ah, that backs up my theory completely. Hmm? Patsy, how would you like to join me in a nice cacophonic auto accident? All set, Patsy? Well, I guess my football helmet's on tight enough, Nick. I feel just like a movie stunt girl who's about to be pushed off a cliff. Well, just hold tight. There won't be any danger. You hope. Well, look... There's Dillon's barn, just around the turn, down there at the bottom of the hill. I can see it in the headlights, Nick. My hunch is right. Dillon's part of the gang. My bet is that he's responsible for the accident young Anderson had. And somehow or other got Anderson to turn the wrecked car over to him. But if you think the gang also stole the Royal Coupe we used as bait... It was the same model as Anderson's, Patsy. Only they took the engine out of Anderson's car and put it in the stolen car. But why would they do that? Because they got the bill of sale from Anderson. And when they put the engine from his car into the car they stole, the whole deal looked very legal. So that's how they disguised the cars they stole. That's how. And now we're going to have the same kind of accident Anderson had. Okay, Patsy, here's the curve. Hold tight. Are you all right, Patsy? Well, all things considered. Quick, give me your helmet. I'll put it in the suitcase with mine. Here you are, Nick. There. Now they're out of sight. Hey, you! Pretend to be unconscious, Patsy. I'm going to pick you up and carry you. Mm, I could learn to like this. Hey, you two! Don't try to get away. What do you mean, get away? We've had an accident. Yeah, I'll say you have. Darn near knocked my barn down. Must have done a thousand dollars worth of damage to it. I'll settle for the damage, but this lady's hurt. Got to get her in the house and call a doctor. What about my barn? I'll take care of that later. You can keep the car for security. Huh? Well, all right. Come on this way. All right, I'm following you. And keep on following him, Carter. What? This is a gun against your back, so no funny business. All right, Carter. Put the dame on her sofa and sit down here with her. Anything you say. There you are, Patsy. Oh. Make mm. yourself comfortable, Carter. Thanks. Calling the big boss to ask about your funeral. 
see that there are lots of flowers. Why? You won't be smelling them. Hello, boss. This is Ace Williams. Listen, Rocky and me are at Dylan's. We're giving him his payoff tonight when he walks the Carter. Yeah, tried to pull a fake accident, but me and Rocky got the drop on him. Now, look, boss, you got an idea. He's already wrecked his car, see? So why don't we put it on the truck and haul it out to the old Morgan Quarry? That's about 60 feet deep. Me, Quarry. Sure, we can put him and the girl in the car and push it off. They're going to kill us. Easy, Betsy. We're not dead yet. That's the idea. Yeah, just, just a nice, clean accident. <laughs> okay, goodbye. Well, Carter, you can pick up the dame again. The four of us are going for a little ride. But only me and Rocky are coming back. Ah, gee, Carter, you sure make a pretty picture standing there on the edge of the quarry holding that dame in your arms. Hey, Rocky, give me a hand back here. Yeah, okay, Ace, I'll be right with you. I think they've got the car balanced right on the edge of the quarry. It means they won't have to push very far once they get us inside. Oh. Betsy, how about a little swim? But why, Nick, are you... The quarry's almost filled with water. You can see it ripple in the moonlight. Yes, it's only about 20 feet from the top. Okay, we're going to pull a fast one on these thugs. Okay, Carter, we're all set. Now, if you... That's what you think, Ace. Hold tight, Betsy. Hey! Hey, Hey, you can't... I'm rocking. They jumped into the quarry. All right, Betsy. I guess so. Take it easy now. Make as little noise as you can. They can't see us, but they might judge where we are by the sound. I think you're a wise guy, don't you, Carter? Well, see how you like this. And here's some more for good measure, Carter. Well, for the moment at least, Nick and Patsy have beaten the crooks at their own game. But they're not out of danger yet. We'll see what happens next in just a moment. Now, back to the case of the lucrative Rex. Today's adventure with Nick Carter. We pick up our story with Nick and Patsy in the water in the old quarry. Ace and Rocky, standing at the edge of the quarry, are shooting at them through the darkness. They stopped firing. They haven't hit us. That doesn't mean they won't. Stay close to the edge of the quarry, Patsy. They're right over us. Can't see us as they move to the other side. I suppose they do. My guess is that they have no more bullets. I counted the shots. There were 12, six apiece. Maybe they're reloading. You better take that chance. Nick, glad you brought here. Swell. We can pull ourselves up on it. <sighs> okay, oh, that water's cold. Oh, Nick. Yeah, you'll never get out of there alive. What are you going to do? Shoot us with empty guns? You ain't got no gun either, Carter. That's why you're wrong. I always carry a little spare and a waterproof case. Quit your kidding. Uh, you're done for. Call this kidding? Hey, Ace. Yeah, it's got to come. I'm beating it. Yeah, so am I, Rocky. But don't worry. They'll never get out of there. They'll drown like rats in a trap. Nick, is he right? Maybe we can't get out of here. Maybe not. But we're going to try. <laughs> Well, Patsy, that wasn't so bad, was it? Oh, now that it's all over, it wasn't so bad. But for a few minutes, Nick, I thought we'd never live to get back here to the office. Well, we made it, and that's all that counts. Uh, uh, dry clothes help, too. Mm. I'm glad I have these extra things here at the office. <sighs> what now, Nick? I've got an important phone call to make. As soon as I'm through, I'll get going again. Okay. Hello, Miss Collins. This is Nick Carter. Oh, yes, Mr. Carter. I have an important message for Mr. Benson. He doesn't seem to be home. Could you take it down and try to locate him? Why, of course. What is the message? Just tell him that I've identified three of the gang and have a police dragnet out for them. Hope to have them in custody by morning. Well, Mr. Benson will be delighted to hear that, Mr. Carter. I'll see that he gets the message as soon as possible. Thanks very much, Miss Collins. Good night. Well, that's that. And now I'm going out to find that gang's headquarters. Find their headquarters? But, Nick, they didn't give us a single clue to its location. Oh, yes, they did. 
Just one clue. Huh? And I'm going to build that clue into a whole court full of convictions. But, Nick... You stay here by the phone. When I call, come running with Sergeant Matheson. And every man he can get his hands on. Now, look, you two. The boss will be here in a minute, and I'm doing the talking, you understand? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, we understand. the boss now. Open the door, Rocky. Sure, Ace. Hey, come in, boss. We're all here like you wanted. Close that door. Yeah, sure. Fools. Bunglers. Huh? Well, what do you mean? So you got rid of Nick Carter, did you? Yeah, sure we did. And I suppose it was his ghost that just telephoned me. Just, just telephoned you? Nick Carter? He did. And he's identified all three of you. Uh, but it ain't possible. You didn't kill him. So now I've got to kill you, all of you. No, okay, Mrs. Now, wait, Eustace, now wait, listen. You fail and you put me in a dangerous position. If I let you live, you know what it is. All happen. right, drop that gun, Mrs. Eustace. Hey, hey, come on, what's Where that? did you come from? Pretty good act you put on this morning when I came out to question you. But I didn't stay fooled. You cowards, if one of you won't do something... I'll shoot else. the first man that moves. We, we, we ain't okay. moving, Carter. Okay. Good. Now drop that gun, Mrs. Eustace. Kick it over this way. That's better. Hey, look, Carter, how'd you find us? you find out, Ace. But first, if Mrs. Eustace doesn't mind, I'd like to remove her wig. You wait! Hey, it you is a wig! This is going to be quite a shock to Mr. Benson, isn't it, Miss Collins? Hey, what's this Miss Collins stuff? Yeah, I thought she was Mrs. Eustace. She's both. You see, boys, by wearing this gray wig, Miss Collins became Mrs. Eustace. Well, I'll be... Of course, be by a... the time Miss Collins gets out of jail, she won't have to wear a wig. Her own hair will be gray. <laughs> I'll be darned. So Miss Collins was a mastermind of the car-stealing ring. That's right, Patsy. As Benson's secretary, working right there in the office of the Underwriters Association, she was in the perfect position to furnish the others with the information that made the racket a success. But well, why did she play the part of Elma Eustace's poor old widow? Oh, that was a smokescreen. To hide her real identity from the gang. Oh. I imagine her original plan was that when the racket petered out, Mrs. Eustace would just vanish. Since none of the gang knew that she was also Miss Collins... They wouldn't be able to blackmail her later or implicate her in any way. But I still don't see what made you suspect her. That one clue I mentioned, Patsy. Hmm? When Ace phoned from Dylan's place, I counted the clicks as he dialed. 333-444 was the number he called. That was the same number Benson had previously given me in case I ever had to call Miss Collins. That was all I needed to know. Gee, but it sounds simple. When you explain it. <laughs> now perhaps you'll tell me how you found the hideout. Oh, that was easy. You see, when I phoned Miss Collins and in that way let her know you and I had escaped, I knew she'd head straight for the hideout. Why, of course. Well, I got to the place she lives just before she left. Oh, but how'd you find out where she lived? Had Maddie trace her phone number. He gave me her address this morning. And where did she live, Nick? Right smack across the street from where Mrs. Eustace lives. Well, what do you know? From there on, it was a cinch. I saw her when she came out of the house fixed up at Mrs. Eustace and then followed her straight to the hideout. Any more questions? Hmm? Oh, Yes, teacher. Who owns that spiffy new sedan parked outside of the curb? That? Well, Patsy, it just happens that was on order for Miss Collins. But since she won't be needing a car for ten years or so, the underwriters bought it and insisted on presenting it to me. Well, oh, that's wonderful. Miss Bowen, may I give you a ride home? Why, Mr. Carter, it will be a pleasure. It isn't every day that a poor working girl... Oh, Nick, that truck. It's going to skid right into my car. Oh, Nick, if that isn't the darnest break. Uh, Here I get a brand new car. Don't even get a chance to blow the horn. Nick Carter, Master Detective, produced and directed by Jock McGregor. Lon Clark is starred as Nick with Charlotte Manson featured as Patsy. Today's script was written by Robert David. Original music is played by George Wright. This is Bob Martinson. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.